Hello everyone, shalom. My name is Rabbi Dan. I'm the director of pastoral care for the Charles B. Smith Life Communities. I wanted to personally present this week's Parsha, and in fact, really talking about Pesach this week. This week's Parsha is Sav, and a lot of the discussion in the Parsha has to do with the Karbanot, the sacrifices, but this is also a traditional time when the rabbi of the community will give a special Shabbat Haggadol Drasha. And we already know that the concept of learning about Pesach occurs 30 days before the Chag. In fact, the Shulchan Aruch already mentions this idea that say that really right after Purim ends, we should begin learning about Pesach. And the truth is the Shulchan Aruch only says the word Chag. We're not exactly sure if it means Pesach or not. Although the Halacha is mentioned during the Pesach discussions, in fact, as a prologue to the Pesach discussions, it talks about this idea. But since it says Chag, we're not exactly sure if it means Pesach or not. And therefore, there are many who will begin discussions of each of the Chagim 30 days prior to each of those days. We may think that Pesach requires a little more investigation and a little more review of the halachot. There are halachot that pertain, of course, a lot to kashrut, to the idea of mixing chametz in the subject of a halachot called tarobes, the mixing. There are concepts of iser um, and heter, um, there as um, when something has become an object of prohibition, can we ever um, find a way to, if it, and that object comes in contact with our pots, can we ever use that pot again, for example? And with tarovis, things that are mixed with one another, if the chametz becomes mixed with um, our Pesach food, can we ever eat it again? We're not going to have a large discussion about that today, but this is enough to say that there is a lot to discuss. That's all to do with kashrut. There's also more to do with the koshering process. How do we kosher this counter? How do we kosher that counter? What do we, how high are our ovens in order to make them kosher from the year to be ready for Passover? In short, there's a lot to discuss. So it makes very reasonable sense that we have this uh, notation to begin our halachot 30 days prior. Now, when it comes to the Shabbat HaGadol, this of course occurs right before the holiday of Pesach. This year, it may already feel like Pesach by the time Shabbat comes. Our kosher kitchen staff has already been working very hard to kosher for Pesach. And if we were to wait for uh, after Shabbat, of course, that's impossible because the minute Shabbat ends, the moment Shabbat ends is the very moment that Pesach begins this year. So the food you will eat during this, uh, uh, this Shabbat will already be very much Passover food. Um, a question arises, what can we eat for the Shabbat meals? We know we have a honor tradition to eat challah. Uh, we do have the uh, obligation to have hamotzi, some kind of bread substance um, for three meals on Shabbat, only two meals on Yantif, but three meals every Shabbat. How is this possible? On the one hand, we have the problem of eating um, bread, anything that's chametz, we can't eat that after uh, a certain time in the morning. This time is around 10.43 a.m. But we can't eat matzah either. And this is based off of Gemara in Pesachim. Gemara in Pesachim, the tractate, of course, having to do with all about Passover, tells us that we cannot eat matzah. And it's actually a Tosafot, a, a set of commentators from the Gemara itself, which tells us that eating matzah right before Pesach is like taking advantage or taking a taste 
of something that you're about to engage with fully before you're actually ready to do so. And that you will lose out on the total joy of eating that first bite of matzah if you eat it too soon. And I think a part of us may think that's funny. Um, if you don't like matzah so much, it's hard to imagine that this taste of matzah will be so joyous that you won't have, that you won't want to interrupt that by eating something else. But at the same time, it's somewhat understandable that matzah is this reserved taste that we want to build up towards. The matzah itself, some people find enjoyable, but it really is the taste of Passover. And Passover is the high of the year, the highest we, we understand. There's the high holidays. A Passover is really a time of national celebration, whereas Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are a time of individual celebration, individual intersection and forgiveness. But really, Passover is the joyous time when our people each year are renewed and are born again as a nation. So that taste of matzah should be saved for that first bite of the Seder. And that's what Tosafot claims in that Gemara. However, he says that there are, there's a certain kind of matzah that he calls matzah ashira. Matzah ashira is anything, is when we put anything but flour and, and water together in a matzah. We know it as egg matzah. But if you look on the shelves, there's also other kinds of matzah with grape juice in it and other flavorings. Rashi was talking about putting grape juice in the matzah. All these are matzah ashira. Now, according to Rashi, that is possibly hummus. We don't paskin like that because if you look in the store, you'll see that egg matzah is just as kosher on Passover as anything else, or at least um, it's um, it's there in the shelves. Um, it says OUP on it. You'll also notice that all the boxes of the matzah that are OUP, that are ready for Passover, also say that, you, that Ashkenazim should ask their rabbi before eating it. Um, and this is because Rashi does tell us that adding anything, including egg to matzah, might create chametz. Now, we don't really, really, really believe that. If we did, we wouldn't have it all on Passover. But it, we really, the rabbis are trying to tell us, you need some mitigating factor in order to have egg matzah um, on Passover. And this year, we have a very good, we have very good reason to have egg matzah. Um, although there is this very slight idea of it being chametz, we, want, we need something to eat that's not bread and it's not matzah. And so we eat egg matzah. The only problem Tosafot had with eating matzah before it was time to eat it is that the matzah we eat on the Seder night, really the very first few times, should not really be this matzah ashira, this, this, um, the egg matzah. Because that really should be the simplest possible, the lechem ani the lechem oni bread, the matzah. Egg matzah can be eaten, even for the Seder, for people that can't digest and have real pain in digesting the plain matzah. But by and large, if you have no medical reason, you should be eating the, the white, regular water matzah. And so it does uh, help us in the case because the egg matzah, um, shouldn't normally be eaten. And therefore, all Tosafot was talking about when he talks about not eating uh, matzah before it's time is all, the only matzah you shouldn't eat before Passover is matzah that you will eat at the Seder in order to save that first bite, that first taste for the Seder itself. So we can eat egg matzah, even those that are have perfectly fine digestive systems, they can eat that matzah um, all during this next Shabbat, up until the Seder, of course. Um, and the other people, we will have Pesach rolls. Pesach rolls 
uh, or matzah rolls, I guess. Matzah rolls are made for matzah, but since they're not actually matzah, you can also eat those um, on the Shabbat, which occurs right before Pesach, as it does this year. Um, that's not all I really want to talk about today. Today I wanted to talk more about um, a certain part of the Seder, and that is the very end of the Magid section. We get to the end of the Magid section, and we have a very famous quote, um, which says uh, that Rabbi Gamliel would say, Rabbi Gamliel haya omer, kol shelo omar shelo shatavarim elu b'pesach, lo yasa yidei chobato. He, Rabbi Gamliel says, anyone that does not um, say these three things does not really fulfill their obligation on Passover. Those three, those three things are what? We have, well, we have three of them here. I don't think we have all four, although I guess the Seder plate sort of has one. Those three things, of course, are Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. So it says we don't fulfill an obligation. And then it goes through to tell us what those things are. But it's a very interesting point that if we don't say those three things, it says we have not fulfilled our obligation. It's a very minimalist understanding of what the obligation of Pesach is. If we were, that would mean that if we only said those things, we would fulfill it. Um, And so why are we so insistent upon these three words when there's so much else um, to talk about in the evening? And really, of course, the mitzvah is the saper, to tell the story. So how could it be possible that we only are looking at these three symbols and these three symbols do not tell the full story? So in fact, we look again to this Gemara um, and discussing um, in the Pesach offering when it says, um, that you have these three obligations, it also tells us, reminds us that in the book of Shemot, in the book of Exodus, it says that on this day, and you shall say, that these are the things that we offer to, to God. Um, that when we are taken out of Egypt, later in time, perhaps, we will look at these things and that said, you will say, unto your children that God took us out of Egypt. Um, that it is the Pesach our sacrifice for God, for he passed over the homes of the children of Israel when he smote the Egyptians, and our homes he saved. And so these things that we have in front of us are meant to engage us. The Pesach, the Matz, and the Maror are not meant simply just to talk about, but are meant to really engage us in the story. And so I would add, that these words, which are actually spoken towards the end of the Seder, right before we eat the, the matzah, and then, of course, we eat the meal, it says these words, which I always found very funny, because after going through all of these other words and stories and prayers, it says, if you haven't mentioned these three things, you fulfilled your obligation, which means that if you could have saved all that time and just said those three words. But I would say that if you've gone through all of that, but you haven't really engaged in your own discussion of things, here's one more chance to do so. Because the Torah tells us that when we look at the Pesach um, sacrifice with the Paschal lamb and the matzah, and then later we add the, the uh, bitter herbs, that should rise in us our experience. Whereas the rest of the story might not have but here's one more chance to do so. And we know this also from how we talk about the evening. The Gemara tells us that when we talk about the Seder, we should start with um, Ganut and end with Shevach. We should start talking about disgrace and finish with words that require us to praise God. And so we start with a possible story of when we felt we, we did the wrong thing and how God forgave us. But we end with the what God, what God gave us that requires us and compels us to give praise to God. We start with Ganut and we end with Shevach. 
Um, but there's a debate, of course, about what is it that we're scars with our disgrace? Is it that we, uh, that God, um, that we were slaves, Avadim Hayinu, or that we were slaves, or is it that our ancestors were idol worshipers? And this, of course, comes from a debate of Rav and Shmuel. Shmuel says that, excuse me, Rav says that we start with Avadim Hayinu, that we were slaves in Egypt. Whereas Shmuel says we should start with, we were a wandering Aramean that subjugated our fathers and that we were ancestors of idol worshipers. Two very distinct ideas. Whereas Avadim Hayinu says that we were slaves and really had no choice when we were subjugated, Shmuel tells us that we were idol worshipers. And these are very important stories to both keep in mind. But Rav, but the Agada is telling us there's the, the Gemara, excuse me, the Gemara is telling us that there's only one real answer, that we should only start with one of them. And so we are really asking, what is it that we should begin the story with? Again, the similar idea we had before, how do we have the taste of what's going to come? How do we begin the idea of what's going to be there? of what's going to compel us to go through this aspect of the Seder. Whereas Pesach, Matzah, and Mara were the end of the Mahid section, one last chance for us to feel the need to share our personal story. This Gemara is talking about the beginning. And in fact, if you look, if you look at the Haggadah, the Haggadah has taken both opinions and we both sing the song, Avadim Ayinu, Ayinu. And we have the uh, words um, saying that we were a wandering Aramean. We both take into account both the words of Rav and the words of Shmuel to understand that we um, both talk about how we were enslaved and how. Um, we were idol worshipers, which are both very interesting. And it's strange, in fact, according, you know, the opinion according to Shmuel is strange, according to, the opinion according to Rav is strange uh, because he says that we should really air, we should be airing our dirty laundry to say that we were idol worshipers. Um, and we have grown out of that and that God even wanted to take us away from that and even wanted to be our people. Um, and this, I think, is a, a nicer message, in fact. If I were writing the Haggadah, I would start with what makes us more, what makes us further from God. What takes us further away from God, of course, is the temptation of worshiping other gods. Perhaps them te that temptation is no longer there, but that is the antithesis of being Jewish and really being Christian or, or Muslim, being any religion that we know today that has God at the center. Worshiping other gods, of course, is the antithesis. But we say the very beginning of our Magi, the very beginning of our telling of the story to our children or anyone around us or even our own selves, we start with saying no. Even after God tried to do this or even after seeing God's wonders, we still chose other gods. And this, of course, occurs throughout the story of our Jewish narrative. We continue to choose their gods. And so we can we put that right in the beginning of the Haggadah because we know that's um, what's going to distance ourselves most from God. And the truth is, how much, however much we say, however much we say that idol worship is gone, it's right there. There are so many things in our life to worship. We worship television, we worship food, we worship other addictions, we even worship celebration. Last year when we could have, we, there was really no way for us to celebrate with each other. We still, some, some people still found ways to get together despite governments telling us we shouldn't. Even now, we see funerals of celebrate, celebrated rabbis, of Jews gathering together, even though God says we shouldn't. God, through the government, says we should not risk our lives. We say we're doing it. We say that we're doing it 
in the name of tradition, but really we're doing it because we're addicted to the ritual. That is worship of idols. We're not worshiping God because if we're worshiping God, we should know that life is more important than any of those mitzvahs. And we should be guarding our safety more than anything else. As hard as it is to be alone for Passover, as hard as it, as hard as it is not to go to a funeral or a wedding, we know that these are still concerns. And at the beginning and during this year, they have, there have been times when it was very concerning to do that. It was, it was harmful to ourselves and a chance to spread it to others. But still we know many people that went to those gatherings despite the warnings and they were worshiping the, the ritual instead of worshiping God. So we know that idol worship and worshiping other entities in our lives are still there. And so we put that in the very beginning of the Gemara to tell us that even though we are, are, are faulty, even though we are tempted, God will still choose us. And more so, Pesach is the time when we are reborn and we come out of this. And throughout the Seder process, the very end ends in Shevach, when God redeemed us. And we know that God will continue to redeem us and continue to make his nation reborn every year and forget about last year's mistakes and bring us to greater salvation to eventually come back to Hashan Ba'ab Yerushalayim and be united with us and all of the Jewish people and all of God's people. I want to wish you a very Aziz and Pesach and a Chag Kasher V'Sameach, a sweet, sweet Passover and a kosher and happy holidays.